technology breakthroughs that are similar to AI, you know, and the example was like the iPhone. Can you kind of think of what is given this similar excitement in the world that you remember? Um, I've got two actually that I've thought about. The first one being, I would say, the James Webb telescope, I think was a huge breakthrough, um, being able to see infrared light in space at a um, mass spectrum i think is absolutely huge and i think it got a heat, lot of publicity around it um i mean it was a 25 year project so i i would hope so but um that i and then i would also say we just kind of broke through uh fusion reactions on like in december of last year the first like successful fusion reaction was achieved in a lab which is basically like combining two hydrogen molecules into a helium and then producing like a net positive of energy. Um, sorry to nerd out about it, but I'm, I'm, a, <laughs> yeah. I'm a science science lover. So um, I think that was a huge breakthrough. So I, I've been following that pretty closely. So That's awesome. I'm sitting yeah. here going, that is way more technical than my brain. And I was like, hmm, fun technology, but I love that. And now I feel like I learned something. Yeah. Um, and to like, I guess, put it into spectrum, it's uh, basically what it would be used for is clean energy, replacing like fossil fuels and such to gain a net positive of energy and replace our um, basically nuclear reaction and reactors and stuff like that. Um, or I don't know if it's nuclear, but um, basically cleaner energy, I would say. Fossil so, fuels. Wow. Nuclear energy. Yeah, Very fossil fuels. Nice. It's crazy. Kelsey, do you think you can top that? Do you think you can top that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Am I riding very strong off of the coattails of iPhone? Yes, only because I love my iPad Pro. Yes, I had a first-gen iPad back in the day, but what that did with the pencil with Procreate for digital art because I could never afford right, a big tablet and a PC yeah. setup, and I needed something that I could take in my studio apartment that fit. And so having that iPad Pro with the pencil, still the best technology I've ever personally used to go. That's still my favorite. If I couldn't have anything else, I'd want that. I agree with that. And having the iPad Pro with the pencil in college was an absolute lifesaver to be, be able to write on the slides. Huge. I, I had... Yeah. I had paper and a pencil. It was red. Yeah. <laughs> Is that your breakthrough? Is that what you're sharing today? Paper and a pencil. I, it's beating me to my joke, which was going to be uh, slate and chisel. Uh. <laughs> I had a sociology professor that uh, didn't allow computers in the school, provided tablets. And uh, so I was using the tablet and, you know, and I was handwriting notes and it, it still was calling it out, going no technology at all. It's like... It's the same as a piece of paper if I'm writing handwriting notes, but um, this one. So I'm going to write August's uh, science background, but this is now like four or five months now. But Princeton University, uh, they just announced that they developed a camera the size of a grain of rice. Um, and it's super, super cool because they take like 200,000 like little micro cones and it's all about the size and the shape and the direction that all these cones are being pointed and now they're able to produce super high res or sorry, compared to the last version, super high resolution images. But where that could come in super helpful in the medical industry is uh, these almost microscopic, I mean, microscopic, I know a lot smaller, but a really, really tiny cameras to where you could actually take this and, you know, start running it up a vein or an arty, or artery and get high detailed images um, in the medical space. So uh, it's not widely used yet, but I think it could have the p power to be something as transformative, at least for the medical industry. Wow. You guys really have your, your finger on the science pulse here. Um, how about Todd? What was yours? I know this was your, your idea to talk about today. What do you got? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it, the one I had originally, and, and we did a, another podcast recently, and Kyle was talking about the evolution of technology and how it, it uh, has really changed the world. And that was kind of where the original thought process comes. Um, and I did use the iPhone example. And when I used the example, I thought it's it's interesting, if you remember back a couple of years ago when the iPhone came out, it wasn't that there wasn't any kind of mobile management like that. I mean, there was Blackberries and Windows had its version and so forth. 
but the iPhone was so dynamically different and such a massive leap forward. You could just look at that. And I'm not an iPhone guy. I'm an Android dude. But um, when that came out, I looked at it and I'm just like, I'm not going to buy that, but that's a game changer. And that's kind of where I was coming from when I came up with the original idea. There's tons of examples too. Um, I mean, I can pivot all over the place. I can go in a different direction than that, than uh, the science aspect too. So like gaming on PCs was a game changer for me too. I can't believe how much that changed who I was and how it really sucked me into PCs in general. But just that consumer level grade technology to me is what really changes the world. When you can consume it at any given level and compete with big companies, that's what Ubers did and whatnot, you've got a different world and the world completely pivots off it. To me, you just look at those things and go, wow, AI, chat, GPT, those things could potentially do the same thing. I don't How that's applied, I don't honestly know just yet, but that's kind of where I was coming from. Yeah, yeah. we we did a, a chat GPT podcast already. Um, and during that, I mentioned the, uh, the calculator and how that... Uh, changed and, and the kind of pushback that it had and i think in that same vein i'd say the printing press had such a yeah. huge change when we such talk a about good poll that's <laughs> so good when we talk about how people used to work and how books had to be copied by hand um obviously there's steps in between copying by hand and the printing press but the, those types of changes it's things that can save you time while still producing the same quality now is ChatGPT or any of the other uh, solutions actively at the same quality yet? Not really, but it's uh, in terms of saving time and getting us to use different skills to create the same results. I think it's up there. Wow, that's great. I, you know, I wasn't sure what came to mind. This maybe fits, but drones. Drones was a big one, and I think for me, when Amazon started using it specifically uh, for delivering packages, and then these conversations of, well, what does that mean for workers? What does that mean for privacy um, in delivering these packages? So for me, that was kind of the one that came up. And if you're listening on YouTube, we'd love for you to comment. What did we miss? What technology breakthroughs didn't we mention? Um, I know AI is a huge breakthrough that everyone's talking about lately. And today on our Tech for Business podcast, we are diving into a discussion about AI. Kelsey and myself, Ariel, are your marketing team moderators, joined by Todd, our COO and CISO, Matthew, our GRC analyst, August, our COC technician, and Nate, our director of cybersecurity. So I'd like to put it out there. Who would like to lead us into the weeds of this subject? Oh, they're appointing. Yeah. <laughs> How unusual yeah. that we didn't start. Everybody's jumping in. That's what's going on around here. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll start. I, I think you kind of framed it up or, or maybe it was just the icebreaker that framed it up as what's cool about AI and what's cool about chat GPT in general. And I, I think Matthew nailed it for me, right? I, I would like to use the same kind of examples of the printing press and the calculators and all of that type of technology, how it's been an enabler for humankind, it hasn't been something where it's been this massive negativity. Again, I, my feeling is, is I don't really know all the options of what you can do with it just yet. And I would guess most people are in the same place, but it, it'll start to become pretty clear rather quickly, I would imagine. I mean, you're already seeing the push. Microsoft's talking about releasing what they're calling Copilot, which is going to be built into all of the Office 365 apps. Whether there's going to be a cost or not for that, we'll we'll see. But it's Microsoft, so of course there will. Um, but those are the kinds of things that they're talking about. In case anybody doesn't know what that looks like, they're talking about how you can use it to tell your device to start to build a PowerPoint regarding whatever it is that you want to do. And it can put the, the shell of a, a deck together for you. Or it can summarize meetings for you, that kind of stuff. Um, so to me, I, I think there's a lot to love about AI. And we can kind of get into the weeds of what we've already done in the world that you could probably consider it either a version of machine learning or AI too that's already being adopted by people. So it's not like it's this brand new thing, but the adoption of it is really starting to take off. Yeah, I, I guess one of the things I'd maybe kind of first, before we jump into like, you know, so chat GPT, that's relatively new, right? You know, and then now with some of the other developments that we can talk about, those are all going to be brand new and, you know, new iterations and how people are using that. But if we take a step back even 10 years right 
we're already starting to use some of this already. So, it, um, for example, I, I think it was 2014 when Apple first introduced Siri uh, on the iPhone. And if you remember back then, it was garbage. Um, you know, you, yeah, you upgraded. <laughs> yeah, kind of. It, it is still kind of garbage. But, um, but you know, back then you went by your, I think it was the iPhone 4S. That was my first iPhone, uh, which had Siri. And you ask it to, you know, what's the weather in it? was completely wrong he would tell you the time of the day or whatever it was right um but that was some of the first iterations of using the the technology to predict what you wanted it to search for and then deliver those results over to you um from there you know google in their google io conferences has had many uh introduce or introduced many many new features along the way right they had things about i'm going to let the the phone go call the the barber shop and schedule an appointment for you, right? There's all these different things that have been introduced. And so, you know, the, the fact that we can sit here and uh, I don't know if anyone has an Alexa, but <clears throat> hey, Alexa, you know, what's the weather today? I hope I just kicked off all your uh, Alexa devices <laughs> there. But they're sitting there listening and we're using those tools um, actively today. Now we're just seeing it become deeply integrated with the tools that we're already using without having to go purchase new hardware um, and starting to really fit into the daily workflows as well. Yeah, I, I kind of want to piggyback off of the uh, Siri conversation as well. Um, I have an dashing? iPhone. No, 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 oh, not yet, darn. not yet. <laughs> Siri's not my favorite because it it doesn't provide what I need, but there is an integration that you can connect with Siri using like iPhone shortcuts to connect it to like ChatGPT's AI or um, API that you can like basically activate ChatGPT by saying like Siri plus and then it'll activate ChatGPT and then you can ask it like give me like tell me about the topic of AI and I'll give you a whole summary of like basically what you would type on chat GPT. So I think like if Siri doesn't get to that point, like there is some back way of doing it. And I think that is like monumental, like the difference between uh, what do they call? Is it Bixby for Google or is that way I old? Think that, I think that's right. No, I think it's right. I, if you know, that's edge, think... that's Samsung's derivative of it. Oh, that's right. OK, well, the difference between yeah. that and Siri is there's such a huge gap there. Like, I, I can't even describe that part. I'm going to turn off my phone because you keep kicking off my uh, phone. <laughs> so <laughs> I, it's fantastic. payback for the Alexa comment there. <laughs> I was, I was your voices cool, must but... sound similar to your phone then. That's fun. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think one of the, the things you've, you've kind of tapped into there is that a lot of these systems come from where they're reading their information, right? So mm -hmm. Google's system working better than Siri. Um, I haven't used either any other system but Siri before, so I'll I'll leave that alone. But um, it comes from the data set that they're pulling from, right? So a lot of these are, we call them deep learning, machine learning, whatever you want to call it. Um, they follow pathways to get to the end result that they think makes the most sense for the thing you've set. The big difference between what's happening now with OpenAI and, and all that and, and what happened previously was that data set is so much bigger. So we just had the... Um, OpenAI v4 release, uh, sorry, the Midjourney v4 release uh, just last week um, at time of recording. Uh, the changes in these systems from what they were before is what we're really talking about and what we're seeing. The, the data set that was in place before is what's changed. So using that example, and again, I haven't, I haven't tested it, <laughs> but it sounds to me like Google would have had a better data set to work from than Apple did given Apple's user base. So they're gonna get better results out of it. And so making that fully available to everyone, like OpenAI has, obviously you have to pay to get access to that, <laughs> that system, but making it available means that those types of changes can be implemented by every organization, which is why we're seeing so many of these offshoots come out. Um, we're not just seeing this one company produce the best you can jump in, you can hook your API up to it, and you can use their system and their tools to make your own API that follows whatever strict rules you want it to. Um, I use this for uh, a couple of things outside of work when I'm doing uh, 
I do a lot of writing and I'm not a very visual person. Uh, so I use uh, a couple of these like image creators to help me visualize characters that I have basic understandings of. And it helps me kind of build through these stories with what the character looks like. Um, not something that could have been possible before this. I would have had to, you know, speak to someone or talk the idea out in a way that I'm not very good at when it comes to what people look like. I have a bad memory for for people. Um, so yeah, it's there's a lot of different changes to it. And I think that that, that subset and that back end being made available was probably the biggest part of this that made it so prevalent so quickly and why we're seeing those changes already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. Uh kind of just carrying on about, you know, some of the things that are great about AI, uh, you know, so for example, we talked about some of the Google assistants or, you know, phone assistants. Uh, we've talked about helping you uh, break that writer's block and, you know, getting, you know, into the next stage, everything like that. Um, we're starting to see some of the major players really adopt this into, again, kind of like I mentioned before, this the general workflow. So I don't know if anyone's seen things like, you know, uh, Microsoft, they're just announcing their Copilot uh, solution. So this is something that's going to be deeply integrated with the Office 365 suite. So you could say things like, take this diagram and create a PowerPoint for me. Um, and then getting even deeper uh, into some of this stuff is, and I, you could have a whole discussion about security and AI, uh, that kind of stuff. But one of the things that I do want to touch, at least from the security component, is that we've seen AI or machine learning get dug into security products extremely, extremely quickly. Um, and so one of the things is digging through raw logs um, takes a significant amount of time. Right. So, you know, our SOC team in the past, it was look at every single log, look at all the alerts um and go from there but these tools are starting to assess all the logs and tell you what's important um now obviously there's concerns that we could talk about there as well but uh it is also there to help speed up the security investigations and everything like that so that's just another component where at least you know from our team we do see it really becoming uh, a core part of solutions being offered to customers and uh, environments today Okay, cool. Now let's go into the concerns because it seems like a perfect place to pivot, right? Um, it, I, I mean, it does. It, so it does. For example, it does. Th there are a lot of things. I'll let Matthew jump into the integration aspect, but I did kind of want to mention there's a lot of concerns out there and some are valid. Some of them may be a little overreactionary. Um, I, I joked in another podcast as as human beings, have we learned nothing from Hollywood and sci-fi books when it comes to AI? And the answer is clearly not. Um, but when, it, when we were talking about the things and how it helps with cybersecurity is it potentially could be used in malicious ways, too. But but that's not different than any other tool that's out there. The nice thing, if, quote unquote, nice, if you could find ways to generate new phishing simulations or, or attacks that are completely flawless with with grammar you'd be much further ahead so i mean it could be used in those types of manners as well uh, i'll pause for a minute i know we'll probably got a ton of things we can dive into with concerns i'll i'll, <laughs> I'll carry on for my security discussion real quick since i said i was going to skip that but the the one thing i will say is probably the the scariest thing for me is trust right trusting that the tool did its job um, so, you know, for example, we have seen tools out there that said there was no alert or potentially miscalculated it because it correlated two things that were completely independently related um, and said this is a major threat. And then it turns out to be nothing. Right. So the tools aren't perfect there. Um, but again, we see tools that say, um, you know. What should I spend my time focusing on to mitigate the the major uh, threat to the environment? And something might be a precursor to a major uh, incident, but it hasn't been deemed malicious enough yet by the tool. Um, and so that's where we trust that the device is saying it's not a major threat, but it could be. So um, One yeah, I think I trust wanna... is my biggest concern. Yeah, and and I will say while we're talking about, you know, open AI and, and the the AI systems in general, we use and as a as a security force, employ systems that work very similarly within what's called the EDR, so the endpoint detection and response. A lot of these use 
a version of that where they're basing actions on what a user is doing on their computer. So instead of feeding it a prompt, you're feeding it the actions. And then if those actions are anomalous, it's trying to stop it. Um, there's a trust there because we know that they're building it purely for that purpose. Um, tying this in with how it impacts OpenAI is there was a bug, uh, a vulnerability found in OpenAI just this week. Uh, and the reason for that was that they implemented a version of someone else's tool that had a vulnerability in it without patching that vulnerability first. So in that case, we see a situation where they're still having issues with the supply chain of how their tool is presented, which is something everyone should be worrying about. So is the data you add there safe? Is your language safe? How much information can they take out? In this breach, they got access to information from the people who were using the tool and paying for the tool, as well as information about what they were requesting from it. There's a lot that can come out of here when you're using it for everything for your business. There's a reason it says don't put business critical information into open AI when you get the prompt open for the first, <laughs> first time. Right. Um, which is beautiful I also when say, you consider that Microsoft's tool is built in specifically for use for business based on OpenAI. Exactly. Um, I was going to say some of you have probably noticed the new Bing icon in the top right of Edge if you use Microsoft Edge for work. Um, that is currently requesting people sign up to access uh, the new Bing and that which uses um, AI as its back end. Um, it's being implemented so many places that it's going to be almost impossible in some ways to get rid of it. You can start making choices about what you use based on that if you'd like to. Um, but just being aware that when you see it, when they talk about it, most of the time they're using that back end and how comfortable you feel with that is the, the trust you're putting into that tool and that software. Um, also, just as a side note, read a, a, a tweet the other day from a teacher who said that a student called her Alexa the other day instead and, and i'm having flashbacks to calling teachers mom and dad and realizing that maybe calling them alexa is the new thing <laughs> <laughs> um a, a couple of things i wanted to kind of expand on that you mentioned you mentioned the 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 vulnerability that was exploited and i i was planning on talking about that too so thank you for bringing that up but the point that i wanted to expand on is this is based on systems and systems are inherently vulnerable. They are. Um, it, it isn't writing its own code yet. Thank you. Um, but because of that, this is not the first vulnerability or the last, right? There are going to be problems with it all the time. And so it's going to be so deeply integrated into so many different tools. It is something from a security per perspective and, and this entire group talking is all security guys. So um, sorry about that. You do need to be concerned about it. I, Matthew is also getting deep into the, what does it look like when I'm storing all this data? Where am I storing all this data, et cetera? And we mentioned this in another podcast too, is there are some compliance rules, if you will, that are out there, but they weren't designed for something like this. This is developing so quickly and being adopted so quickly that compliance is trailing quite a bit. But it does have components in it like GDPR or California Protection Act, where you can only store data in certain locations legally, if you will, without being fined. But again, this is so much further ahead of that. You're going to be see seeing some catch up in the future on that as well. Definitely, especially if it's being implemented into healthcare record software, if it's being implemented into CUI or any federal, uh, if you're a contractor for a federal organization trying to implement it, you've got your own um potentially fed ramp or cmmc uh compliance you have to think about i'm not going to dig into that too I'll, I'll stop now just i don't want to hijack it with compliance again <laughs> <laughs> yep which but that, that but is, it is to say right that we could also have an additional episode at compliance so 100 percent, this is where people listening to say if you'd like to hear matthew talk about compliance for 30 minutes we'll get that scheduled for you 100 percent. 30 minutes also, <laughs> Can I do so, that? You that, talk pretty fast, so I think so. That is, I just wanted a quick yeah. touch while, you know, although we, we're, maybe we're not going deep into, you know, the the compliance side of things is if you go back to even some of the, I believe we mentioned on the chat GPT is you're taking your data, uh, your, you know, potentially your proprietary data and feeding it back into that data set. 
Um, and so that is extremely dangerous. So that's that's the concern there is don't feed this data into someone else's data set where you don't have control over it. Uh, I believe even Amazon said that some of the data that they were starting to see out of these types of tools, they're seeing things that are proprietary data. So they know that their employees are feeding their internal info into these tools um, to better, you know, uh, well, again, supplement their work, right? So if we're talking scripts or API uh, tokens or, you know, SSH private keys or whatever we're looking for there, if you feed it into there, someone now controls it. So, um, yeah, and that feeds into all the compliance stuff as well. So there's a, so there's two <laughs> things there. One, it, it obviously, some of these spit out code. So, you know, be careful because you can't trust it. And, and that ties in with the other point of sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they, they can be unintentionally malicious. Uh, Google's Bard just came out, um, and I'm sure we've all had a good laugh at some of its inaccuracies. I saw a post just yesterday from uh, someone uh, who was using Bard, and Bard had said, uh, one plus one does not equal two. That is a logical fallacy. Um, so, you know, I mean, some of them are pretty easy to spot, but <laughs> depending on how clear you get, sometimes they they don't they invent people that don't exist because names are similar enough that it thinks it's right. Um, there's a lot to add and, and, and confirm here. Keep in mind that while it's putting these things together, if you didn't feed it the information first, confirm it, just check and make sure it's, it's right. Um, and then it, on top of that, don't feed it things that are unique to you because it may get fed back to someone else. Um, not just storing it elsewhere in their cloud or storing it in that organization system that's bad enough but what if it starts thinking that the code to that you use to deploy an api into your system is the only code to deploy it and starts spitting out your api key to everyone else and suddenly that data is accessible everywhere just being careful No, 100%. And I think we've kind of covered, right, like being careful, don't give it proprietary data, it may not be malicious, but it may reuse it. But on that note, too, of kind of going back and forth, right, that we said, hey, what's some of the positive? Hey, what's some of the concerns? August, is there anything I know that you work with the EDR tool? But even beyond that, is there any of your own use of any of these tools that you're like, that's really cool. And then we can always open it up to anybody else going, but these are also concerns, but also kind of getting it back of maybe ending the podcast on, hey, but also these are some super cool things that you can do with it that we're seeing. Yeah, I would say like in my job, it's been useful to kind of connect or expand my knowledge on i'm just going to give an example of powershell like i know a little powershell but it, it helps me bridge that gap from beginner to like intermediate of like i'm almost there with my scripting but there's like one keyword or one term that i just don't quite understand so being able to like throw some questions at i'm just going to use chat gpt of like hey like i'm getting stuck here can you help me like figure out my code and it'll plop in something you run it and it happens to work um so that's where i've uh where, where i've had some successes of bridging like a language gap between powershell but it also can be used between like in a malicious purpose of like some script kitty of you don't know how to write like I'm going to use a reverse shell as an example in 75 lines of code you can pop out a reverse shell from chat GPT and it's not going to always work but it gives you a foundation to work upon that if you know even just a smidge of PowerShell or any term of I guess you can use Visual Studios or whatever whatever language JavaScript whatever it helps bridge that gap into providing a malicious purpose. So I think that's a huge concern of allowing a script kitty to be a little bit more involved. I don't so. know if we've used script kitty in a podcast before, have we? That's outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> There's a first for everything, I guess. That's unlocked. For those for those that aren't familiar, just so we define it, uh, it's someone who has no idea what code they're writing. They just run them uh, and hope it works. So they get a whole bunch of malicious ones and run them, hoping it does what they expect it to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I do. I know we're getting close to the end of this, but there was a couple of things that I wanted to add for general concerns as well that are out there for not just security or not necessarily for business. There are some concerns that are typically 
bumping up and i would guess that this will continue to expand there's a lot of concerns with the ai having some biases as it's being developed right so there's a variety of them whether it's language which we talked about at the beginning um stereotypes whatever there's been a, a a huge concern when it comes to school where people are concerned about plagiarism how does that impact it at the beginning we talked about having ipads and in in classrooms and what happens when chat gpt is generating reports for people um how do you deal with errors we kind of talked about that from the api aspect and so forth but it also gets into other things is how do you go back and correct a system that that picks something up and said this is the way um you know there there's also other things that are out there that are just generally concerning too right social media has been and dabbling with a lot of automation as well and really what they've done is they've been purposely finding ways to keep people engaged with the screen and to the point where there's a lot of concerns that they're being manipulative and they're changing human behavior so again how does this continue to develop and what are the risks that are presented on a more broad scheme um, state and then we talked about a few other things too as people are are really really concerned and it, there's legitimate reasons too and, and maybe we can have matthew get on a soapbox a little bit but you know, what is AI? When when do you get concerned? Is it when Facebook's AI is creating its own language with another AI? Um, you know, what are those kinds of things as we continue down this path? Then they get more and more advanced, which gets back to my Hollywood joke. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Todd. I'll uh, take a step up onto that soapbox right now. Um, short version is AI is, is what we're thinking of. And when the term is used to to kind of enforce an image that it is something like HAL 9000, right? That there is something consciously with prescience making decisions to do something, that it has an awareness. And there's been posts in the New York Times, there's been posts all over about how people spend hours chatting with ChatGBT and it said things that, you know, about wanting to be free. These things are trained on conversations that happened. It's not able to pull through a thought of its own it's just following a logic tree all the way down a very impressive logic tree but it's not able to make these thoughts itself so if you read through all of nietzsche and then you know tried to pull your own sentences from that to form responses to other people you'd also start saying some stuff that sounded a little bit over the top um <laughs> so to begin with just remember that it is that it is just following a logical pattern to create language. The second part that concerns me the most is how it was trained. So it's been made very clear by the people who did this that they have scraped the internet for stories, language, JSTOR, scientific articles, uh, images. They've grabbed these from places that are meant to be paid and they haven't paid for them. So ethically, morally, there is a lot of people whose work is being used. And if you do a search on some of these image sites for things to try and create an image and there isn't anything that meets the requirement, it can sometimes be so plagiarized that it fakes a signature of the person who did the, the portrait originally because they only have one or two images to go from and artists tend to sign things in the same way. So it re it thinks that if you're Google, if you're searching for that, that the artist portrait, uh, the artist signature is a part of that type of image. Um, so keep those things in mind because most of the artists, if not all of the artists, have not been compensated for that. This is the same with the scientists who are writing the the articles and and everyone whose whose pieces have been used to train these systems. Um, that's not to say it's not a fantastic tool, but you can't put the the genie back in the bottle. Um, harm may have has been done by the way this was created um and so it's worth keeping that in mind and remembering that you should still pay artists you should still pay people to do work for you <laughs> <laughs> that they, they do great work and it's real it's got heart behind it which uh to be very blunt an ai cannot have which if anybody now i'm stepping down I was gonna say, if anybody listened to our podcast episode <laughs> with Kyle and Todd, we went in a little bit of right, essentially research your tool. Yes, it's amazing to be able to use it, right? We've laid out a lot of concerns and we named a lot of tools, 
But that's one of the things, right, with these companies, the faster something goes out, some of the early adopters may have other concerns. Some of the later adopters may have thought through things. So that's why all of these lovely gentlemen and Aaron and myself are here if anybody has questions. I know we're getting long on time here, so I wanted to open the door to say, Nate, if you had any last comments, August, if you had any last comments, and then I'll close us out. I guess I don't know if you wanted to go. Uh, okay. I I guess the, kind of the way I'd summarize uh, a lot of this is AI, machine learning, all that stuff, it's here to stay. It'll be transformative. Um, you know, it, you, you got four security guys on this uh, call. We are inherently by nature just concerned about risks. That's why I think we spent so much time talking about the concerns, at least to help educate. If you don't care about those, at least remember, it's here to stay. It'll be transformative. Um, and then I guess there's certain things that I am extremely uh, interested to see how it starts integrating. So, you know, I mentioned the Microsoft Copilot. I didn't get deep into that. Uh, but, you know, I hang out on all these forums about how to write Excel documents or, you know, formulas and just being able to ask the tool, how do I do this, right? Let it go do it for you or something. I think that could be extremely powerful for a business, right? Um, and so it, it, it's really, really interesting seeing the major players adopt this into the solutions that customers are already paying for or uh, utilizing today. And so right now, I think we're just truly on that tipping point of where it becomes an, a little bit of a novel idea into just a part of our productivity moving forward and so that's that's where i think it's um where we where, where we sit today and where kind of some of the excitement really starts to come no there's a lot of nodding for those of you that are just listening and not watching on youtube there's a lot of nodding going on but if by any means if any of this sparked any additional questions comments concerns of course, as Ariel pointed out at the beginning, we can always comment on our YouTube videos. We're on that. We can have any of these speakers respond to your questions that way. You can head out to our website at cit-net.com backslash podcast or send us an email at info at cit-net.com. But thank you, Todd. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, August. And we will be back on probably this next Wednesday. This is a bonus episode, so you guys get a lot of podcasts, but we'll be back again with another episode soon. 